My name is William Litchfield, the Director of Advancement and Alumni Relations here at Vancouver Island University. It's my honor to welcome you to VIU and the Arts and Humanities Colloquium today. On behalf of the colloquium or organizers, I'd like to thank the Dean of Arts and Humanities, Dr. Ross McKay and his staff for their support of the colloquium series. I'd like to also thank the theater for hosting us and providing technical support and the Media Research Lab for filming the event today. The series began in 2009 to bring forward conversations and ideas sharing scholarly and creative work in the area of arts and humanities. It's these conversations that enable us to better understand the world from both a global and, and personal perspective. Since its inception, the series has grown in reach and stature, and the very fact that all of you are here today demonstrates the importance and relevance of these conversations today. I was asked to reflect and share on the special importance of arts and humanities in our current university context with a focus on the advancement and alumni relations perspective. The Advancement Office, Office's role is to inspire our friends in a thriving VIU. At the heart of that is to build and maintain relationships with donors and alumni to provide the best experience for students and to help VIU achieve its vision. This could come through uh, creating new scholarships, supporting program development, the faculties, and anything else the university might need. When I think about the skills we need in our department, specifically related to fundraising, one of the first things that comes to mind is the ability to communicate and tell stories. VIU is bursting with great stories about our students, faculties, programs, and not to mention the transition we've taken from a vocational training school to a community college, to a university college, to the university we are today, and the university we have in our vision for tomorrow. We've taken the lead on a number of initiatives that deserve to be heard through our communities, our province, our country, and beyond. Specifically, being a national leader in the tuition waiver program for youth who are in the foster care system, and driving the Canada Learning Bond initiative that supports low-income families to set up an RSP, an RESP at no cost. The programs give youth the opportunity to participate in post-secondary education where there may not have been that chance before. These stories need to be told, and our team is just one cog in that communication gear. With the changing times and changing demographics, we need to use a number of creative methods to tell those stories, be it face-to-face, -face, written proposals, or more often than not, through digital means these days. The growth of digital media has created new opportunities for us to report and share the impact of VIU through our community, and to expand that vision and value of VIU throughout. The more we tell our story, the more our community understands what we do and how they can be a part of the fabric of VIU. Since the university has had the mandate to grant degrees, there have been thousands of students who have completed their studies in arts and humanities, notwithstanding all the students that started with us prior to that point who had to complete their degrees in other institutions. We started to reach out to those alumni to find out where they are, what they're doing, and how their education played a pivotal role in what they're doing today. We heard from a lawyer that said her studies not only created the foundation for her, for her law degree, but also developed the key skills that she uses on a daily basis, critical thinking, analytical reasoning, and public speaking. She goes on to boast about the breadth and depth of her program that made, it a, made her a success. Another alum is now in a leadership position with Aboriginal Tourism BC, responsible for partnerships and strategic initiatives. Skills including teamwork, communication, and problem solving that she developed at VIU paved the way for her to follow her dreams, work with Aboriginal communities, and support local economic development. Both these examples are echoed in a report I came across earlier this week out of Alberta, highlighting the challenges faced by businesses today in finding quality applicants. Even as new graduates are seen as being technically capable, uh, Businesses say they lack the soft skills, such as communication, decision-making, critical thinking, and teamwork. They have the skills to get hired, but the question is, do they have the skills to remain employed? As we go forward, we need to look at the current realities, discard the out-of-date stereotypes regarding starving BA students and grads. We know from our alumni that they're achieving great success in the workplace. They po possess a dynamic combination of technical skills and soft skills. I know you'll enjoy today's presentation. I encourage you to continue and support and participate in the many VIU events throughout the community this year. 
It's now my pleasure to call, call on Marilyn Bowring, a longtime member of the Creative Writing and Journalism Department at, at Vancouver Island University, who has recently retired, to introduce the speaker today. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, thank you, William. Um, it's my pleasure to get to introduce Kathy Page, who's giving the presentation this morning. Kathy and I have worked together at VIU for uh, many years, um, and also at various readings. We've introduced each other and listened to each other read. Just over a year ago in Scotland, where we were both um, teaching together, I first heard her read from the stories in her book, Paradise and Elsewhere, um, which is a book for which Kathy has just been long listed for the Giller Prize, which is a huge honor. <laughs> Paradise and Elsewhere is a book of fabulous tales, and I was struck when I heard her read at the range of Kathy's writing and her ability to surprise. I had known her primarily before that for gritty, realist, psychological novels, uh, particularly the story of my face in Alphabet, and had been intrigued by some other things that she was doing in her, her more, uh, most recent book, uh, novel, The Find. She is, I think, on fire with ability and imagination. She turned up, thank goodness, at VIU not long after she moved with her family to Salt Spring Island from England and we were clever enough to recognize her abilities and to hire her, and I strongly encourage everyone to keep her as long as possible and do whatever you have to do to do that. Her literary biography is one of depth and breadth. She's the author of seven novels, the first published in 1986, and two books of short stories with another coming out next year. She holds an MA degree in creative writing from the University of East Anglia, and subsequently trained, and I don't think there's a cause and effect link here, uh, in counseling and psychotherapy. Her work has been long listed for the, the Orange Prize, shortlisted for the Governor General's Award, and now nominated, as I said, for the Giller. It's a surprise, it doesn't now surprise me, to find that Kathy's interested in the poet Edward Thomas, and for reasons that are both literary and personal. As a poet as well as a novelist, I always see it as a turn to the good when an experienced fiction writer makes a place for poetry in her published world. I know many fiction writers who write poetry, often secretly, but the public expression of love for and understanding of what poetry has to offer seems to be more rare. Kathy's experience of this, um, I don't know if she will uh, talk about this or not, but uh, her experience of this, uh, of offering a poetry for her um, current work came about when she read to her father when he became unable to read. And we know that poetry persists at the roots of what makes us human, and it tends to flower at these moments of deep emotion, whether they are love and birth and marriage, or whether they are illness and death. Flowering brings to mind very much Edward Thomas, who before he was uh, a poet, was a writer of outdoor books, books of wandering the countryside and seeing what was on offer from both humans and flora and fauna. Um, and he had a, a brief flowering himself in his life and his work. Penelope Fitzgerald, in a London Review of Books article that I had for some reason kept from back in 1996, quoted F.R. Leavis's comment about Thomas, his poetry is a question of fine apprehensions, intuition on the edge of consciousness, which would disappear if looked at directly. And I think it's this ability to look both directly and indirectly that gives Kathy Page's insights or strength. Edward Thomas died in the Battle of Arras, April 9th, 1917. This is part, I believe, of what Kathy's going to explore and possibly question for us today. Arras is in the open countryside just to the south of Vimy Ridge, which just about everyone I think will have heard of, where the Canadians began their attack as part of the Battle of Arras. That was on Easter Monday, 
1917. My grandfather had been wounded a little earlier on the Somme and was in hospital when his battalion took Farbus Wood on the southeast of the ridge overlooking Arras. And he was back in France for the battle at the nearby Hill 70, a hill so fly flat that it has an airfield on it. And then in time, just in time, to head north to take part in the battle for Passchendaele. So I have walked the southeast part of the ridge where it overlooks Arras, with its nearby fields of chard and wheat, its skylarks and its unexploded, to this date, shells. Shell craters amid brambles, nettles, and cow pants. It's a paradox and fertile ground, I'm guessing, of what Kathy is going to be talking about today. Please welcome Kathy Page. Thank you so much. It was perfect. Thank you, Marilyn. That was absolutely a perfect introduction. Um, before I dive into this um, presentation, I just want to make some of my own thanks um, to the um, Arts and Humanities Colloquium, of course, for inviting me to speak. Um, and then in terms of what I'm going to present, I, ha I have quite a lot of debts. Um, the Edward Thomas Fellowship um, in England, it's an organization which dedicates itself to the work and reputation of a poet who is mu much revered in the UK, I think perhaps less known here. Um, for now. And um, the Edward Thomas Archive at the University of Cardiff Library. Um, they've got a huge collection of original documents, um, memorabilia and so on, but they're also trying to become a sort of worldwide repository and include um, copies of everything else that they don't possess. Um, and I'd also like to thank the uh, Research and Scholarly Activity Committee who um, supported me in my research in that library. Um, and an, uh, an online organization called the Great War Forum. Um, some of you may have visited the Great War Forum. It's open to anyone. It's a vast online resource um, of information and stories, and I, I see it in a way as a, a kind of collective act of remembrance for the World War I dead. And um, two other writers I'd like to thank are Edna Longley for her wonderful um, detailed notes in her edition of the collected Thomas poems, and Matthew Hollis for his quite recent biography, All Roads Lead to France. So now I have a little preamble before I launch myself properly into the, into the reading, because it is more of a reading. I'm, I've created a text which will be published later this year in the New Quarterly, um, and I'm sort of testing it on you. Um, so what I'm going to present is perhaps best described as a hybrid of essay and a personal story. Um, it's about the death of Edward Thomas during the Battle of Arras um, and about the reasons for my interest in it. But it's also about the ways we need to make and use stories in our lives. And it's part of an ongoing project, um, a book of poetry-related pieces, I guess. I think this is perhaps a little bit... Yeah, is that better? Yes, thanks for telling me. Um, so um, one of Edward Thomas's poems is very important in what I'm going to read to you in, in the story. And since it's quite short, I'm just going to begin by reading that poem so everyone has at least some sense of, of where I'm coming from and where the story I'm telling is coming from. The Lane. Someday, I think there will people be people enough in Froxfield to pick all the blackberries out of the hedges of Green Lane, the straight, broad lane where now September hides herself in bracken and blackberry, harebell and dwarf gorse. Today, where yesterday a hundred sheep were nibbling, halcyon bells shake to the sway of waters that no vessel ever sailed. It is a kind of spring. The chaffinch tries his song. For heat, it is like summer, too. This might be winter's quiet. While the glint of hollies dark in the swollen hedges lasts, one mile, and those bells ring, little I know or heed if time still be the same until the lane ends and once more all is the same. 
This poem was written in 1916 after Thomas had enlisted but before he set off for France where he was killed. It's an interesting poem. I don't really have time to talk too much about it now, but in a way it's very typical of him, I think. Um, it doesn't, he, his work doesn't often address the war directly. Maybe we can talk about it more later. So, Waters that no vessel ever sailed. My father would not have understood or approved of this journey, 5,000 miles on an apparent whim. Yet it is because of him that I've traveled to Cardiff, climbed the Corbett Road Library steps, and now wait amidst a glowing cluster of students, bright in their summer tops, denim and striped leggings, for the library to open at nine. I've come to look at a dead man's things, and I've brought my father's book with me, Edward Thomas's collected poems. Modest, cloth-bound, it lies on my bedside table back at the hotel. Many of its pages bear its owner's penciled underlinings. On the title page, there's an inked inscription from one of his teachers, dated 1934. Read to me then. How many times? In those last months, we increasingly depended on poetry, though eventually the titles and then the authors escaped him, and whoever was reading had to make the choice. Even so, as the poem began, his eyes would sharpen their focus and pin themselves to the reader. He returned from the dream or the blankness he had been inhabiting to the shared world. The last time I read him Thomas's The Lane, he was beyond speech and could not make his habitual remark about the way it ended. Why did Thomas repeat that word, same, in the last two lines? I saw him frown and said it for him so that his face could relax. Once during that time, he woke from sleep in his winged armchair, held me in his gaze and said, I never wrote anything, I never did. His tone was bemused as if to say, how come it had slipped my mind? Going through the attic after his death, I found in a tin box amongst the dusty suitcases and abandoned light fittings, a copy of Helen Thomas's memoir of her husband, the Faber edition, with both parts combined. And I learned that when R.G. Thomas's portrait come out in, came out in 1985, my father had borrowed it from the library and written some responses in a small spiral-bound notebook, less than a third full, which also ended up in the tin box. A man who could not love, he wrote, or not fully. Yet she was the opposite, had a gift for it. Thomas married to the English language. As for Robert Frost, how I wish I could like the man and the work, but I only half get there. It was a shock to realize how much he had in the course of his long life thought about this other man, that he thought him about, him, about him as a man, as well as as a poet. He had compared himself to Thomas and wondered, what was it like to make those verses, to feel the words rise up inside? And so, it was as if he had left something for me to do. I read on into Thomas's work and beyond, clinging to a raft of letters, prose works, critical studies, and memoirs, diaries. Thomas went out of his way to preserve his prolific correspondence, and the volume of material is truly enormous. An incident or observation from one of the poems will appear in a notebook, a letter or two, and then in a poem or an essay. A kind of triangulation occurs and there's a feeling of depth of the past like the poem in a process of reanimation. For example, Helen mentions in her book, World Without End, the walks she and Edward took together in the autumn of 1916. And Thomas explains in a letter, letter written to her in January 1917 from the front that the lane which he had sent her before Christmas was suggested by one of these, a walk down Green Lane in Froxfield in September. In a letter written two weeks before his death, he tells her that the chalky soil around Arras remind him of the same place. 
Perhaps because my own family history is full of gaps and questions, and there is so much that I didn't ask, I have found the amount of detail, the sheer comprehensiveness of Thomas's record, the fact that so much can be known, oddly comforting. But equally, there's a feeling of anxiety when the various accounts of the same event do not quite fit together. In particular, it seems to me that there are several versions of the way Edward Thomas died. There's no doubt it happened on April the 9th, 1917, the first day of the Battle of Arras, just months after he had arrived in France. But the details vary a great deal, and how, amidst such la lavish documentation, could that occur? Which version is correct? I tried to dismiss these questions. After all, a death is a death. But I could not, and that's why I'm here. Along with notebooks and letters, the Edward Thomas archive at Corbett Road, Hol Road holds objects, including the things Thomas had in his pockets when he died. I've come to see if I can find any kind of truth in these physical, tangible things. And in any case, I want to see them. Special collections is in the basement, where dim lighting and dry air create a suitably funereal atmosphere. Though the archivist, Alison, is long, young and very much alive, she rises to greet me, her eyes alert, her hands warm. I've laid the memorabilia out for you next door, she says, and gestures at a glass wall to her right. As I sign the copyright form, the excitement that's been growing inside me distills into a kind of queasiness, so that when she unlocks the door to the small room with its glass wall, tomb and TARDIS at once, I feel momentarily faint. Perhaps I'll lose myself here, be trapped in the past, in someone else's past. Perhaps find nothing at all. No flash, she reminds me. The letter must stay in its wallet, but otherwise you're welcome to touch. If you need me, I'm working just next door. Alone, I notice the sound of muffled footsteps, a walkway runs by outside, and a constant stream of invisible students flows past. A small high window in the solid wall opposite the glass one admits only distant, obliquely filtered light. A pair of rectangular beechwood tables have been pushed together to make a larger, square one that more or less fills the room, and upon it are the items I requested. The pipe, tobacco tin, watch, and the last letter from Helen, which was folded inside Thomas's diary. The diary isn't available here, but available digitally. All these things were either in Thomas's pockets or hands when he died. He was a family man of 38 who need not have signed up, a newly fledged poet, a person who had frequently felt desperate enough to consider taking his own life. How much of this story did my father know and remember? It was all new to me. Thomas served as a forward observation officer. On the morning of his death, he was positioned on the outskirts of the ruined village of Bohrain, about a mile ahead of his unit's guns and close to the line. It was a very cold morning, the horizon dark with snow-filled clouds. The Allied bombardment, which began at first light that morning, could be heard across the channel in England. It was immense, annihilating, otherworldly. All this, the context, is well documented. It's easy enough to picture him standing or kneeling in some kind of muddy bay in a trench, a tall, very thin man wearing an oilskin coat and a tin hat. He leans tight up against a wall of wet sandbags and, using his binoculars, peers through the small opening. There would have been a, a telephone, possibly a signaller, to report back. Close by was a reinforced dugout for them to retreat to if enemy shelling came too close, which it did on that morning. As fellow, John, as fellow officer John Thorborn put it in his letter of 9th April to Thomas's wife, Helen, it happened this morning by shell fire in the observation post. There was some kind of explosion, a somehow broken body. That's what Thorborn says. Other accounts are more specific, but they also diverge from each other. Perhaps the sheer volume of documentation that precedes this final moment has created an unrealistic desire for clarity and certainty. 
Even so, I'm not the only one who wants the story to be absolutely clear, who yearns to know exactly how it was and also to understand its variations. One researcher I met online shared with me, using a mixture of modern and period trench maps and photographs, what he believed to be the exact spot where Edward Thomas died, a grassy triangle by the road to Tilloy. He had visited it. Borains, he reported, had grown much bigger and the grassy triangle was right at its current edge in front of a large modern house and not far from a McDonald's. The landscape bore out his calculations. It was the only slightly elevated place that offered the kinds of views that Thomas would have needed and which he mentioned in his diary and letters. I tracked down that same grassy triangle online and on my computer screen looked out from it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> looked out from it um, towards the bare trees that marked the soft rise of Telegraph Hill, upon which Thomas's unit was firing, and to the southeast, the spire and huddle of buildings that was Newville Vitas, a key ob objective that day. On that day, those fields would have been a mass of craters, trampled mud, bodies, and wire. But in the image I saw online, they were tinged with green, the blue sky clotted with cloud. Since then, the grassy triangle has been built on and therefore no longer exists. It's a warehouse of some kind. But it did once exist, and Edward Thomas was there. His clay pipe would have been in one of his pockets, probably the left one inside the coat. And here it is on the table. A deep gouge marks the bottom of the bowl where it joins the stem. Other marks at the mouth of the stem could be from Thomas's teeth. Pale but grubby looking, the clay pipe makes me think of excavated bone and I do not like it. Though despite its macabre qualities and apparent fragility, I force myself to pick it up. It is heavier than I expected, cool. The other thing to note is that it's the simplest and cheapest form of pipe, an unusual choice for an officer. In a letter he wrote to a friend in thanks for sending some of his favorite brand of tobacco, York River, Thomas wrote that on some evenings he did nothing but smoke. Sometimes his heart raced and he could not be sure whether this was from excessive smoking or what he called excitement under fire. There was constant shelling at night. The shells made what he called a, bra a black grisly flap in the air and the walls of his billet shook. More than once he narrowly escaped being killed. He was living very close to death. There is something that makes me more and more anxious to survive, he wrote, and to have it behind me, but with me. Thomas was buried on the 10th of April. After the ceremony, his commanding officer, Franklin Lushington, wrote to Thomas's wife, Helen. He mentioned the pipe, though he did not, as others later would, link it directly to Thomas's death. I wish I could convey to you the picture of him, a picture we have all learnt to know and love, of the old clay pipe, gumboots, oilskin coat and steel helmet, he wrote, adding, when I get to England, I shall be happy to come and tell you anything more you'd like to know, and I will write to you in case you would like to see me. Of the death itself, he wrote, you have probably heard the details, it should be of some comfort to you to know that he died at a moment of victory from a direct hit by a shell which must have killed him outright without giving him a chance to realize anything. This, Lushington's first version, adds only a little to Thorburn's account, not just by shell fire, but a direct hit by a shell. Did Lushington mean this? If so, there would have been little or nothing of Thomas left. Lushington went on to have a long career in the military and fought in the Second World War too. He also wrote novels, memoir and essays, and in so doing, he drew heavily on his First World War experience. Excuse me, experience. His account of the role of artillery in that war, Gambardier, was published in 1930 under the name of Mark Seven. Later, in the preface to his memoir, Portrait of a Young Man, 
Lushington expressed considerable doubts as to the exactness of his memories of his boyhood. Quote, with the passing of the years, the spectacles of the imagination distort the truth, and it becomes difficult to distinguish the present seeming of past events from their reality. But in Gambardia, he was writing as an adult, looking back a mere 15 years, and it was, he insisted in the afterward, accurate. Every story told herein is a true story, put down as it actually happened, he wrote, and every character mentioned is drawn from life. He assigned each officer in the battery a pseudonym. Edward Thomas became Thomas Tyler. Lushington, or Seven, told how on the day before Thomas's death, a 5.9 plunged into the ground a foot from Tyler and failed to explode, though the wind from its passing knocked him down. That night in the mess, someone said, Thomas, you were evidently born to live through this war, and they all drank his health. At seven o'clock the next morning, he was killed in the observation post by a direct hit through the chest. Through the chest might suggest some kind of piercing wound, a piece of shrapnel, perhaps. Lushington's written accounts in his letter to Helen and in Gambardier do at least seem broadly similar, and in both he uses the phrase direct hit. Yet they were not the only accounts he gave, and Helen and the family and the general public came to ex accept a significantly different version of Edward's death. In it, the clay pipe played an important and even deadly part and was found unbroken in his hand when he died. This other version comes from two sources, Lushington again and the poet, Eleanor Fargen. Fargen was in love with Thomas, but their relationship remained platonic. She became both amanuensis and family friend, and then, in the aftermath of Edward's death, Helen's support. Forty years later, she wrote an account of all this in her memoir, The Last Four Years. She recalled that she and Helen were staying in Chiswick, London, following Edward's death. A sergeant, home on leave from the front, learned that Thomas's widow was nearby and came to visit them. He told how, in Thomas's sector, Allied forces had routed the Germans and were celebrating as if the war itself had been won. Thomas, he said, emerged from, quote, behind his gun, leaned back into the opening of the dugout to light his pipe, and was killed. The pipe was in his hand when he died. Eleanor Farjohn's memory was of the sergeant saying that Thomas was killed by a German bullet. But, she wrote, she realized that she must have misremembered th what the sergeant said. She must have, since sometime after the war, Helen had met and talked with Franklin Lushington, who had given her a somewhat different version of Edward's death. In it, a blast of air associated with a passing shell had killed Thomas instantly and without any visible wounds. Eleanor quotes Helen, who said, or wrote, it's not clear which, and there is no available letter, that his beautiful body was unmarked. There is such relief in those words. In the heart of her nightmare, she has found one small good thing. Uh, it is certainly possible that Thomas died that way. The huge air pressure fluctuations modern artillery creates can irreparably damage lungs, stop the heart, stun the victim with a fatal concussion, and such deaths were first documented during the First World War. In his book, Cheerful Sacrifice, Jonathan Nichols notes, quotes an eyewitness account of just such a woundless death which took place in Arras on the very same day as Thomas's. An explosion threw one Frank Clark into the air and he landed on his hands and knees, unmarked but dead and, quote, soft as butter, his pockets full of letters from his children. Thomas could have died from a blast of air, and he may have stopped to fill his pipe just before he died. He could have died from a direct hit through the chest or even a sniper's bullet. It seems possible that several versions may have been combined to create one that's become current. And the clay pipe, which may or may not have been in his hand, only, only reminds me of this uncertainty. I'll admit, I'm glad to put it down. 
Helen and Edward married young because of her pregnancy, and it was not an easy partnership. It's possible that without a family to support, Edward might have been able to fulfill his writing aspirations earlier to a greater degree. Yet one thing they never failed to do was communicate. The paper of Helen's last letter to her husband is frayed, and the document comes sheathed in a protective folder. I can see how she folded one sheet of creamy paper in half to make a four-page booklet. She covered three sides of this in her generous, free-flowing handwriting, and then she, or he, folded the booklet again horizontally into three, twelve small rectangles in all. There is no accompanying envelope and no date. To read this brief last letter to her husband is to plunge into a vortex. It pulls you out of yourself, immerses you in her predicament, in their relationship, in love, dread, and hope. I have read it before. I know I will eventually have to follow it again in her handwriting, word for word, but now, I'm telling myself, my concern is with it as a thing, as evidence even. Impossible to miss is the red-brown stain that spreads over the middle of the first page and the rippling, concentric creases which spring from the letter's horizontal folds. These exactly match the creases that can be seen on digital images of Thomas's war diary, which also bears a red-brown stain on one of its covers. Thomas kept Helen's letter in his diary. It's very tempting to assume that the rimple, ripples in the diary and on the letter were caused by the shockwaves from that fatal blast of air, but it may not be so simple. Thomas's diary was precious to him, and he makes clear in his correspondence that he had a habit of leaving it behind, just in case, when he felt that he was going into an especially dangerous or exposed situation. A forward observation post on the first day of the Battle of Arras was about as dangerous a place as it's possible to imagine. It could be that he did not take his diary with him that day. The previous day, though, he was in a theoretically safer situation at the forward command post when he experienced the near miss about which both he and Lushington wrote, though they disagree about how close the shell landed. If, as Lushington says, the wind from that shell's passing knocked Thomas down, is it also possible that this was when the creases in the diary and the letter were formed? According to the archivist, there is also a photograph of Helen that has similar creases. Are the reddish stains on both documents blood? This could be settled, but it would still be impossible to know whether it came from a fatal injury or was the result of what Thomas, in his diary, called a scratch to his neck that happened during the near miss the day before. The stain is fainter on the back of the letter's first page, and the rest of Helen's message is unmarked. Farewell, and God bless you, and keep you safe, and bring you back to me whose heart and soul and body are yours ever and whole, I read, and then make myself put it down. I stand and stretch. The light in the room has softened. I think about how we sometimes create fiction, even when we don't mean to, and prefer the best story over the truth. I wish, of course, that I could talk this over with my father face to face and hear his thoughts. I wish I could tell him how oddly comforting I find it to know, from reading one of Thomas's letters, that an elderberry hedge, albeit bare of leaves, grew right in front of the observation post where he was killed. Did my father, breathing in and then out, again and again and again, beyond what I thought possible, hear the poetry, or the music, or me saying goodbye? Did he feel how much I loved him? Certainly, I like to think so. Time is this story's element. The bombardment of April the 9th began at 5 in the morning. Thomas's sector became involved at 7. The range and intervals of firing were carefully planned, calculated, and scheduled, the aim being, as Lushington wrote, to create, quote, a storm of metal which, like a solid wall of flying death, 
should move before our infantry from trench to trench. Accuracy was essential. All watches were synchronised. Thomas's pocket watch now lies in a pouch made from two pieces of soft cream-coloured leather joined with neat cross stitches. Helen, I think. Helen made this for him, and my hand pauses momentarily on the way to pick it up. It's the kind of thing you might do if your husband was going to war. You might sew tiny stitches. You might try to keep his things safe in the hope that this would somehow protect him too. For a moment, I feel in my own fingers the work of making those stitches, the push of the needle through soft but resistant leather, a tightness in my chest and jaw. The idea of Helen sewing arrives in my head as if it were a declaration of fact, though of course I know it is not and try to banish it. I ask myself rather coolly, but would that be before or after he died? Their daughter Bronwyn, or even the younger one, Mifanwi, could have stitched it, or someone else entirely. In each of these instances, there would be a slightly different story. In any case, here it is. The silver plate is tarnished and coppery in patches. The face is simple, Roman numerals ringed by two concentric lines marked out into divisions for the minutes. The watch's hands are bright gold. At the base of the display is a separate dial, right where the Roman six would have been, with its own small black hand to count the seconds. According to most accounts, this watch was stopped at 7.36 in the morning by the same blast of air that killed Thomas without marking his body. More than 85 years later, downstairs in special collections, I can see the hour and minute hands with just 14 degrees between them and also 11 seconds, new to me, on the smaller dial. The stopped watch connects beautifully with the rippled edges, pages of the diary and with the letter. It seems like proof and it corroborates to within half an hour all of the versions of the story, Lushington's, the sergeant's, and that in the official war diary, which shows that the plan, at least, was for Thomas's battery to fire from 7.30 to 7.49 on lane, presumably clearing barbed wire. We talk of the passage of time. The traditional view of time is like that of a river flowing on. But some people have always thought of it differently, and when Thomas was writing, the nature of time was under debate. In a 1908 paper, The Unreality of Time, philosopher John McTaggart argued that time was an illusion. Perhaps, as he suggested, time is more like a kind of simultaneous eternity in which every moment exists forever, present in the vastness of a multidimensional medium not yet fully understood. The future is already here. I like the idea, though I don't often feel it. The epiphany in Thomas's The Lane, however, seems to me to be about just such a feeling. And in any case, I am inside whatever it is, here in the glass-walled TARDIS with Thomas's stilled watch in my hand and thousands of pages of his correspondence stored under controlled conditions just the other side of the wall. Far to the west, my husband and children are emerging from their sleep. For a moment, I feel as if I might be there dreaming, but no, I came here quite consciously after months of what can only be called obsession, looking for some kind of answer as regards Edward Thomas's last minutes alive. The back of his watch is rough and rust red, tempting to connect this with the stains on the letter and the diary, and of course, this could fit with Lushington's first version, the direct hit through the chest. Yet surely, someone would have wiped the blood from the watch before sending it home, and rust caused by water is just as red. Even if all these stains had a common cause, it might have nothing to do with Thomas's death. The watch, designed to measure something that may be illusory, tells me that everything I can imagine is possible. I can imagine a fatal wound of some kind, or a blast of air. I can imagine a stopped watch or a wound down one. I tend to dismiss the bullet, 
but I can imagine that the nameless sergeant on leave from the front, sitting in the sun in a rose garden in Chiswick with two women who loved the same man, both distraught, took the tea offered, did his absolute best with what he recalled or had heard, trying at the same time to provide some consolation. And I can imagine that since no one ever mentions him again, he went back to the front and was killed. I can imagine that at some point after his letter of condolence, Lushington helped to make a death that Helen could live with. She was in the grip of what her daughter called terrible lethargy and desolation for many years after Edward's death, and she recovered only through the writing of two books about their life together, As It Was and World Without End, published in 1926 and 1931. She was writing the second of these at about the same time that Lushington wrote his account of the war, Gambardier. Helen wrote, on advice, for therapy. Like Lushington, she initially used pseudonyms to protect the living, as she said, and also, she later said in an interview, she gave herself some novelistic license. Lushington, a tall, long-faced military man, and Helen, a small, wiry woman with glasses and wild hair that always strayed from its arrangement. I can imagine these two walking, talking together after the war, perhaps in the panelled study of one of Lushington's country houses with carefully landscaped gardens glimpsed, glimpsed through leaded windows. L Lushington was orphaned in his childhood. He had lost his brother and countless friends in the war. He was a kind and sensitive man, and she was broken-hearted. Perhaps he found the small thing that could console. Perhaps, with the very best of intentions, Lushington merged the blast of air from the dud shell of April the 8th with the fatal direct hit of April the 9th. Perhaps, over time, the woundless death merged with the pipe-smoking of the sergeant's account, creating a version of those last minutes that allowed Edward Thomas to taste victory and avoid terror and pain, a story which at least freed Helen from her anguish at the damage done to the body of the man she had loved so very much. I can imagine it being like that, and also that Lushington would not want to include this version in his public historical account, Gambardier. He would see it as for Helen alone. Or it could be that Thomas's heart and his watch were stopped by a blast of air that day. But in the chaos of battle, it took Lushington, who was not in the observation post himself, some time to piece together what had actually happened. That the direct hit reported to him on the phone was not exactly a hit. I can imagine that too. And that the only witness, a signaller who phoned through the sad news, later died or disappeared. I can imagine that when Lushington did understand the nature of Thomas's death, he might have felt that this knowledge was an intimacy, something for Helen alone to know, and did not feel it fitting to give the details in another letter or to the world in his book. Or perhaps there was a letter and it has been kept private or lost. I can imagine it all these ways. In any case, Lushington became a Thomas family friend, and 80 years after Edward's death, his son, Stephen, published a short extract from another autobiographical account of his father's, written shortly before Lushington's death. In it, he describes Thomas as being killed by a shell, though he remembers some aspects of the day in considerable detail. Quote, it began to snow. Outside the quarry, on the track leading up to the front, the cavalry were moving up. Little men on hairy, unclipped horses mudded to the hocks. Coming towards them under the falling snow were the stretcher bearers carrying Edward's body, trudging unsteadily down the rough track. Particles of rust adhere to the dampness of my palm. The watch is a stopped heart and at the same time, it is just a simple, mechanical, broken thing. The pipe, watch, and letter were all in Edward's pockets, and that is all that I can truly say.
The tobacco tin is not mentioned in any account, but it makes sense to believe that it was there at the end, if the pipe was. Palm-sized, circular, gently rounded, like a bright silver pebble, it fits perfectly in the palm of my hand. The lid, a slightly smaller circle set within the larger shape, bears the poet's initials, E.T., engraved in the centre. I shake it gently by my ear and then probe the narrow groove with my nail, find a concealed catch. The lid springs free and the dark, complex aroma of tobacco rises from the empty space within. Could a smell possibly last that long? I pull out a chair and sit, the tin still in my hand. Such a perplexing and lovely thing. I'm close to tears now. I feel both near and far to what I came for. I can imagine Thomas pressed close to the wall of sandbags while his unit's shells rip the air above his head. Unheard, the watch in his right-hand pocket marks the seconds as they pass. He peers out at the dark shape of Telegraph Hill, and I can imagine something similar to what he saw as he focused in on the tangled barbed wire there. Shells from both sides of the line thud into the ground, blast fountains of earth into the sky. The ground shudders. The thin snow blows in his face. The wretched mud is frozen thick beneath his feet. Behind him, the black hole of the dugout entrance. Directly in front, the twigs of the elder hedge. Tufts of yarrow green the lip of the trench. He watches the infantry swarm as planned through the wasteland of posts, craters, broken trees. He turns slightly and trains the binoculars on the thicket of wire around Neuville Vitasse, where shells are just beginning to land, and someone like him must be looking back towards his position from an enemy observation post. I'm imagining all this, basing it on evidence, but still imagining. And if I want to feel sure about the way this story ends, I will have to choose, just as others have. What kind of ending would I give to the poet with whom my father sometimes compared himself, to the man whose words he carried, repeated and reflected upon year after year, shared with his children, mouthed silently in the last days of his life? I'll give him the anticipation of a smoke, pleasure, however small, the knowledge of victory and a moment of relative quiet, another man calling out his name, Thomas. Numb, exhausted, he lets go of the field glasses and with them dangling from his neck, leans back against the sandbags while he feels in his pocket for his pipe. After the pandemonium of the barrage, what's left of the world begins in small ways to return. There are bursts of song, men shouting to each other, the cries of the wounded, ongoing fire. The ground still shakes. There's the rush of his breath in and out of his lungs, the wind in his face, that simple, brute pleasure of being alive. Above the cordite and rot, he scents the faintest whiff of sap from the blasted trees. Thomas takes a pinch of tobacco from his tin, then slips it back in his pocket and wades towards the opening of the dugout, chalky mud clinging to his boots. Tamping tobacco into the pipe, he's about to hunt for his lighter when he senses movement in the hedge behind him and turns, a blackbird, not singing, but alive, picking its way among the twigs. And then he is walking with Helen in Froxfield, He hears the birds in that other hedge, so deeply green. He feels Helen's hand in his pocket, the warm silence between them, the sun on his face. Kissing, they taste again the tart sweetness of the blackberries, walk on. Leaves, branch, fruit, tangled against the very bright September sky. And for a few paces, nature has turned herself inside out. Every season exists at once. At the same time, he knows how it will feel to share the memory with Helen and how it will be when, still later, he writes, Some day, I think, there will be people enough in Froxfield to pick all the blackberries out of the hedges of Green Lane. He hears the way the words will sound in his ear, 
feels his hand move across the page, his heartbeat quicken, and then, out of nowhere, comes the shell's mechanical wail. My hands shake as I fit the lid back on the tin. Thank you. I have finished with these things, I tell Alison, except the letter. I'll take a break now and come back to that later. Actually, she says, we're closing now. Are you all right? I nod, make my way back out into the afternoon light to the roar of 21st century traffic on the road. At first I'm stunned and then I'm angry with myself. Why fall for almost birdsong? Why not go the whole way, give Thomas the thrush I knew from his diary that he longed to see and hear, or the chaffinch that's in the poem? Why not imagine the vision of the green lane after the shell and make it perpetual? Why imagine in that hell on earth the promise of some kind of rebirth only to annihilate it? Yet now my recreation feels re to, real to me and I can't change it. I wait for the lights, cross the main road and walk on into the sun-drenched park my cheeks wet, carrying the ghost of what I've imagined a dead poet to feel, impatient to read again his half-remembered lines. Today, where yesterday a hundred sheep were nibbling, halcyon bells shaked the sway of waters that no vessel ever sailed. It is a kind of spring. The chaffinch tries his song. The verses join me to the poet and what he saw, thought, felt, and to you, my dear father, who survived the next war, lived another 65 years, loved my mother, never wrote, and died in a small bedroom with the curtains blowing in the breeze. Hearing them, I feel you listening. Thank you. <laughs>